Afterglow Movie Net, Saturday, 10.30 p.m., W5FC.
This is the W5FC repeater, PL110.9. Meeting on the air, first and third Sunday, 7 p.m., W5FC. Mr. Chairman, I need to make myself very clear. If we uplink now, Skynet will be in control of your military. But you'll be in control of Skynet, right? That is correct, sir. Skynet. Does anyone need to use the repeater before we begin the 9 p.m. Skynet? Whiskey Bravo 5, Oscar Zulu Lima. My name is Brenda. I'll be your net control for this station of the DARC Skynet. Skynet is a weekly net called every Saturday night at 9 p.m. concerning the subject of astronomy. Our purpose is to help amateurs become more familiar with the nighttime and daytime sky, astronomy, and space in general. This net is open to all amateurs interested in this topic, and we encourage your participation comments and suggestions for this net. Stations with priority or emergency traffic may enter the net at any time using the pro sign break break and your call sign. Are there any, uh, is there any emergency or priority traffic? This is a directed net. Please do not transmit without direction from net control. That would be me. 
As stations are reminded to ID at the end of your transmissions. This weekly net operates on 146.88 MHz with a PL tone of 110.9. Check-ins via Echolink are also possible using the W5FC-R station ID or Echolink node 37247. Tonight's topics, astronomy charts, pictures, and live audio and video links are available online. Go to W5FC.org right now for the complete list. Remember to tell, tell others about this popular net. All amateur operators are welcome. You need not be a member of any amateur radio club to participate. This net is 90 minutes long and is structured in several parts. One, general announcements. Two, Texas Astronomical Society of Dallas events, where and when you can look through a telescope. <clears throat> National Space Society events. Discussion topic of the evening was up. Space exploration and space history. Constellation of the week. Space launches of the week. And recent astronomical discoveries. Visible satellite pack passages over the next couple of days, astronomical Q&A, and 73 round. All amateurs licensed to transmit on this frequency are invited to check in. So let's start with low power and short time check-ins. Please come now with your call sign, name, and where you're transmitting from this evening. Kilo India 5, Gulf Romeo Hotel. Melissa, Search City. Kilo 5, Mike, Charlie, Delta, Cody, and Dallas. Low power. Okay, we have two, Kilo India 5, Golf Romeo Hotel, Melissa, from Cert City, and Kilo 5, Mike, Charlie, Delta, Cody. We'll move on to regular check-ins, general check-ins. Please come now with your call sign, uh, your name, and where you from, uh, what your QTH is. November Tango 5, Tango Bike, Tony in Dallas. Guys, India. Tom, Louisville. Kilo, Foxtrot 5, Zulu, Bravo, Lima, Bill, Farmer's Branch. Kilo, Foxtrot 5, Quebec, Echo Kilo, Jarrett, and Euless. This is... Alpha Golf 5, Papa Mike, Rich and Rockwall, AG 5 PM. Well, that's a little thin, but maybe we'll get some more as we go along. We have uh, NT5TM, Tony, KE5ICX, Tom, KF5ZBL, Bill, KF5QEQ, I think it's QEQ, Jared, and um, AG5PM, Rich. Do we have any echo links? We'll put out a call for more general check-ins. Please come now. 
Kilo India 5, Kilo Whiskey Golf Cruise in Arlington. Alpha Alpha 5, Alpha Hotel, Robert Richardson. Okay, I uh, did have a double in there. I have KI5 KWG Cruise, uh, AA5 AM Robert, November 5 BB Bill, and uh, if somebody doubled with you. Uh, may have been Chaz. Would you please come back, Chaz? I'm sorry, I didn't mean to uh, be a double. This is KF5, JHA, Chaz, Mesquite. No problem, KF5, JHA, Chaz, WB5, MFI, Ted. All right, well, we'll pick some more, pick up some more check-ins in a little bit, but let's get started. Do we have any general announcements for this evening's net? It's going to be ham, astronomical space, of general interest to license hams. November Tango 5, Tango Mike. November Tango 5, Tango Mike. Go ahead, Tony. Thank you very much. I'd like to uh, call everyone's attention to the fact that, that the Dallas Amateur Radio Club Lecture and Lab will be one week from today. We're building an easy and inexpensive active attenuator kit to help with fox hunting. It's only $20 and it includes a nice 3D printed case, connectors, and battery. More details can be found at w5fc.org. Tonight's Afterglow movie is the obscure made-for-TV production Absolute Zero from either 2005 or 2006, depending on where you watched it. I, I have watched it all, and you could do that too. There's plenty of time. Uh, yep, Absolute Zero tonight at 10.30, plus or minus five minutes. But on a happier note, this Sunday is a third Sunday, so we'll have a meeting on the air at 7 p.m., a great chance to share what's going on in your ham world, and a racy's training net at 8 p.m. I hope you can join us for all of our nets, NT5 p.m. Thank you, Tony. Um, we have another check-in, Kilo 5, Kilo Oscar Bravo, Philip. Philip, uh, welcome to the net. And other announcements. The AMSAT Radio Amateur Satellite Group has two nets available to Dallas residents on Tuesday evenings at 8 p.m. Central. You'll need Echo Link installed and be registered. You can find the net under Groups and AMSAT. Also, a live audio link is available on their website amsetnet.com. Net originates in Houston. Dallas Amset Net East, Dallas, Fort Worth, Texas. 
Is every Tuesday at 8 p.m. on this repeater, 146.88 megahertz, feel 110.9 megahertz, Tuesdays. Tom, N5HYP, is the net control. All are welcome to check in. First Tuesday of the month is DARC Club Net, Club Night, so no AMSET East that night. Now is AMSET Net. West is every Wednesday at 9 p.m. on the Arlington repeater. 147.14 megahertz, PL 110.9 megahertz, positive offset. Okay, we have um, the regular nets that uh, the DARC hosts. On Mondays, the first week, it's Ham Fixins. Second week, MCOM 101. Third week, Ham Fixins. Fourth week, Geek Net. Fifth week, Surprise Net. If we told you what it was, it wouldn't be a surprise. Or our participation is encouraged. On Tuesdays, we have AMSET, AMSET East, 8 p.m. Friday's Cert City simulation at 8 p.m. Learn about emergency radio communications via Cert trained amateur radio operators. Melissa, KF5GRH, is usually the net control. Visit the most disaster prone city in the universe every Friday. Cert City, all are welcome. Then on Saturdays, we have TETNET from 7 to 8 p.m. and, of course, Skynet at 9. The first and third Sundays, Dallas Amateur Radio Club meeting on the air, photo. And daily, we have the AWRL Net, National Traffic Tra System Training Net, every night at 6.30 p.m. All are welcome to check in on any or all of these nets. All right, we have tonight's Afterglow movie, and it is a real treasure. Um, tell you what, KE5ICX, Tom, why don't you read this to us? Oh, I'll be more than happy to. You know how much I enjoy reading this to you. Let's see, this is... David Koch was a climatologist, and everyone hated him. Weather forecasters, weather people on TV, even the National Weather Service thought he was a first-class jerk. It was when he discovered that the Earth's axis was shifting and causing Miami to have a white Christmas the people, that the people really disliked him. Even the unlikable jet stream guy, who had no friends of his own, even stopped answering Koch's call. That's when things started looking, well, pretty bad. Actually, I think it was the magnetic uh, pole. That's what it was, change in the magnetic pole, which is actually what we're going to talk about tonight. So join us for Absolute Zero from 2005 for three. doesn't matter. It, 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 it's good on any year that it came out, depending on where you're thinking about it. Uh, but back to you, Brenda, ke 5 ic Uh, thank you. Any uh, relationship between um, that and reality is purely coincidental. Next up, Chaz, KF5JHA, uh, would you talk to us about the next Texas Astronomical Society Club meeting and other activities? I just realized what I get to follow every week, yeah. Oh, yeah, um, if, if we have the slide, please, sir. The next Texas Astronomical Society of Dallas Club meeting will be held on Friday, September 22nd. That's about six days from now. The meeting will be held at 7.30 p.m. in person at the University of Texas at Dallas and also held on Zoom. The feature speaker is Lisa Actor from Lowell Observatory. I think her topic is about the library there. Saturday night, public observing sessions Skynet was picked to be on Saturday night so that there was an opportunity for live reports from the Texas Astronomical Society of Dallas public observing session. Now today is the third Saturday of the month and that stargazing is held at Cedar Hill. Now I'm not sure if it was still uh, going on or if it was canceled due to the clouds, but do we have a ham radio operator at the stargazing that would like to make a report? If there is, Come now with your call sign. Yeah, 
I thought it might have been canceled because of the clouds. Now you can check the TAS website at texasastro.org for up-to-date information and details about meetings and public observing sessions. And this is KFI. Jay, back to our neck and roll. Brenda, back to you. Thank you, Chaz. Next up, National Space Society events and activities. We call on Bill, November 5, Bravo, Bravo. Uh, would you please tell us something? Yes, I certainly will, Brenda. This is N5BB. I happen to be the uh, membership director and member at large for the National Space Society North Texas Chapter. We're a very active chapter with lots of Chapter of the Year awards, and we do a lot of things at various locations. Uh, this last week, we well, actually, first thing that happened in the last week, it's been a very busy week, we had a meeting last Sunday on September the 10th. We always meet on Sunday afternoons, the second Sunday of the month at 3.30 p.m., uh, normally in Irving at Spring Creek Barbecue. And the topic was private property rights in outer space. And the presenter was our own uh, chapter member, Kamisha Simmons, who is a lawyer and very familiar with these topics. She was a presenter at the International Space Development Conference in Frisco in, uh, in May. So that was very interesting, talking about private property rights in space. And then on Wednesday this last week, uh, I was unable to be there. I had a conflict. But uh, several of our chapter members went over to Cattle Mills Airport, which is near Greenville. It's just this side of Greenville off of I-30. That's the airport that Exo Aerospace uses. And uh, they are a Texas company. Uh, currently, they move their headquarters to Greenville. But they have their test facility at Cattle Mills Airport. And they were testing a uh, rocket engine at reduced throttle in conjunction with uh, a partnership they have with Purdue University. Uh, that's a lunar lander test. And so they did a, a rocket test there. This was um, because uh, the National Space Society invited them. Uh, the uh, NBC5 was there. And they got a lot of good video and interviews and put it on the, uh, on the nightly news. So you may have seen that. Uh, that was Wednesday. And if you want to find out more, if you go to the Facebook page for Exos Aerospace, that's E-X-O-S, you'll find a, uh, a link, I believe, there to that NBC DFW uh, uh, interview and a recording of the rocket test. You can see some of that. Um, so Exos Aerospace is there in uh, the Cattle Mills Greenville area, about an hour east of Dallas. They are one of 12 companies in the U.S. with an active launch license. So there's 12 companies in the U.S. with a launch license currently to launch rockets. They're one of those 12. But there's only three companies in the U.S. with an FAA-licensed reusable rocket, and those companies are SpaceX, Blue Origin, and Exos Aerospace. And uh, so they're a low-cost la uh, launch company with a reusable booster. Uh, they do their uh, launches at Spaceport America, which is in New Mexico, uh, north of Las Cruces, near Truth or Consequences, New Mexico. So that was the interesting stuff that was happening this last week. Very interesting. This is in 5BB. Our next meeting will be on October the 8th at Spring Creek Barbecue in Irving. And the speaker will be Nancy Golden, who is an author and a local member of our group, the North Texas Chapter of National Space Society. And she will be speaking on a continuously occupied, multi-purpose Mars surface base. So a proposal for a, a base on the surface of Mars. That's going to be on October the 8th. Then on November the 12th, our meeting will be uh, by Dr. Pascal Lee, a very well-known Mars researcher. 
and he's in charge of the the Mars analog on an island in Canada. I think it's Baffin Island. It's up in the Canadian Arctic. It's a um, this is in five BB. It's a desert island in the Arctic, believe it or not. And there's a moon, excuse me, a Mars analog base up there. Uh, and uh, he will be talking about humans on the moon and Mars. That's Dr. Pascal Lee on November the 12th. Then on December the 10th, we'll have our holiday party. The current plan is to have it at my new house here in Irving. My solar panels are up. The house is all working. So it's got an operational house here. And if you have any interest in National Space Society, you can reach me at space at byram.net or N5BB, that's November 5, Bravo, 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 November 5, Bravo, Bravo, at ARRL.net. Thank you, Brenda. This is N5BB. Um, do we have any more chickens right now? Kilo 5, Juliet, Delta Whiskey, Mobile, Bell. November 5, Oscar, Thought, Squat, Clay, and the Sea. This is? Five, Mike, Romeo, Oscar, McKinney, Tim. This is Whiskey Five, Golf, Uniform, Sierra, Gus, far, far northeast Dallas. This is Kilo, Foxtrot 5, Papa, Foxtrot Charlie, David, Carrollton. Kilo, 5, Juliet, Delta, Whiskey, John, Coppell. Mike, Golf, Joe in Arlington. Okay, I'm going to need at least one fill. I've got um, November 5, Oscar Foxtrot, Clay, uh, K5, Mike, Romeo, Oscar, Tim, Whiskey 5, uh, GUS, Gus, KF5, PFC, David, K5, JDW, John, and Joe, I missed your prefix. Kilo in Arlington. Okay, I think I heard Kilo Golf 5, Zulu Mike Golf. Um, if that's not right, come back. Okay, back channel says that that is accurate. All right, so let's move on. Now, <clears throat> when I chose this article, the title is, Why Does Earth Have Magnetic Poles? I had no idea what this week's movie was about, and I uh, got into the movie a little bit, and I said, oh my goodness, this is too close to home. Uh, difference, this, is a, this is a scientific article. The movie was 
clearly fake science. But we're going to get into that later when we do our net after this net, afterglow net. So why does Earth have magnetic poles? This article is borrowed from Live Science and it's written by Joanna Thompson. Earth is the only rocky body in the inner solar system with strong magnetic poles. So where do these poles come from and what do they do? Earth is unique in the solar system for a number of reasons. It's the only planet with a breathable oxygen atmosphere, it's covered in liquid water, and it's the only celestial body that we know of to harbor life. An oft o often overlooked characteristic that makes our planet special, however, it is the only rocky body in the inner solar system with strong magnetic poles. Your compass would be useless on Mars. But where do these poles come from and what do they do? To answer these questions, we'll start with the journey to the center of our planet. Earth's core is separated into two layers. The inner solid layer, I'm sorry, the solid inner core and the molten metal outer core. Both layers are made of a cocktail of magnetic iron and nickel with a few dashes of lighter elements such as oxygen, silicon, and sulfur. The inner core is extremely dense and hot, like a giant incandescent marble. But the outer core is fluid, and it swirls around this solid mass with its own convective current. It's this constant convection that generates Earth's magnetic field. John Tardu Tarduno, a geophysicist at the University of Rochester in New York, told Live Science. As heat from the inner core continuously radiates into the outer core, it meets material cooled by plate tectonic activity. This cycle drives convection, giving rise to the so-called geodynamo that produces the magnetic field. Other planets, like Mars and Venus, don't have magnetic fields in part because they lack plate tectonics. Evidence suggests that these planets may have had uh, once had self-sustaining geodynamos, but that they petered out for some unknown reasons. Mercury does have a weak magnetic field, but it's only 1.1% as strong as Earth's and doesn't do much to shield the planet from solar radiation. <clears throat> as the liquid metal in Earth's outer core flows, its motion and high iron content cause the planet to act like a huge dipolar magnet with one negatively charged pole and one pos positively charged pole. Around 80% of Earth's magnetic field is organized this way, but the remaining 20% is non-dipolar rather than forming parallel bands of magnetic force. There are certain regions where the field swirls and eddies, behaving like weather patterns that kind of float around, Tarduno said. These irregular patterns <coughs> produce weird patches in the magnetic field. Places like the South Atlantic Anomaly, a large swath of the Atlantic Ocean where the intensity of Earth's magnetosphere dips dramatically. Researchers think this dent in the magnetic field arises from unusual tectonic activity underneath Africa. Areas like the South Atlantic Anomaly are fascinating, but they're also concerning for a couple of reasons. The magnetosphere is like a protective envelope. Joshua Feinberg, a geologist who specializes in paleomagnetism at the University of Minnesota, told Life Science. <clears throat> it helps to deflect huge amounts of dangerous solar radiation away from Earth, acting like a planet-wide layer of sunscreen. In areas where the magnetosphere is weak, extra doses of radiation leak through, potentially contributing to higher rates of skin cancer. Another concern is the effect on satellites, Tarduno said. Bursts of radiation from the sun, called coronal mass ejections, can knock out satellites and other spacecraft as they aren't shielded by Earth's magnetic field. This can have catastrophic effects for telecommunications, internet access and GPS services in anomaly impacted areas. The South Atlantic anomaly may be 11 million years old, according to a 2020 paper published in the journal PNAS, and it might be connected to another planetary magnetic field phenomenon, pole reversal. 
The history of Earth's magnetic field is written in ancient lava flows and deep sea sediments. The types, uh, these types of rocky material are rich in magnetic metal fragments, such as tiny chips of iron, which orient themselves along magnetic field lines. Eventually, that original alignment gets locked into the sediments, and we get these deep time records of how the Earth's magnetic field was oriented, Feinberg said. From these records, scientists know that our planet's magnetic poles drift over time. Currently, the geographic North Pole is about 310 miles, 500 kilometers, away from its corresponding magnetic pole, which is technically magnetic south at the moment. And roughly every 300,000 years, the poles suddenly flip, reversing magnetic north and south, according to NASA. However, the paleogeomagnetic record shows that a complete pole reversal hasn't happened in about 780,000 years. Some researchers believe this means we're due for a flip, and that the strength of the South Atlantic anomaly could indicate that one is close. If the poles were to reverse, Earth's magnetic field would dip to 20% strength, possibly for centuries. Such an event would plunge our current global communication system into disarray. However, other studies suggest that a flip is not imminent. Either way, Feinberg said, setting our planet's interior and the paleo-geomagnetic record will help us understand the complex interplay between the magnetosphere and life on Earth and possibly help us prepare for a future change. And this is WB5OZL. Do we have any more check-ins at this time? All right, next we have a segment called What's Up? KS, KF5, JHA. Uh, please go ahead. This is KF5QEK, and I'm just kind of listening right now. I don't really have much to add other than, you know, I've just been playing with packet radio stuff lately with some uh, vintage gear. Anyways, that's all for me for now. Back to the next control. Going on astronomically over the next couple of weeks. I'm sorry, I missed your call and your name. Would you repeat it, please? KF5 QEK, is that the one you, who you called? This is Jarrett and Ulyss. Okay, KF5 QEK, Jarrett, welcome to the net. Okay, this is KF5 JJ Chaz. We call this segment of Skynet What's Up because it's all about what's going on astronomically over the next couple of weeks. That's slide number one. Slide master, slide number two. The moon was new on September the 14th, so the current phase of the moon is a waxing crescent. You might be able to see it through some clouds tonight. The first quarter phase of the moon was uh, on, uh, is going to be on September the 22nd. The September 27th, the moon is at Pergee, which is the point in the moon's orbit that is closest to the Earth at a distance of 359,911 kilometers. On September 29th, the moon will be full. On October the 6th, the moon phase will be the third quarter. On October the 9th, the moon is at apogee, which is the point in the moon's orbit that is furthest from the Earth at a distance of 405,426 kilometers. Slide master, slide number three. Comet Nishimura is a relatively bright comet in the early evening sky, uh, western sky. It is estimated to be around fourth magnitude, which is, could be a naked eye object from a very dark location, but since it's in strong twilight, it might be able to be seen inside the city with binoculars. September 23rd will be the best date to see the comet, because before and after that date, the comet hugs very close to the sun in the sky. You can look up more information by just searching for Nishimura. 
Slide master, slide number four, please. Today, on September the 16th, there was a daytime occultation of Mars by the moon. This happened from 1.46 to 3.10 p.m., uh, our local time. A telescope would have been needed, but it was cloudy in our area, so it was not visible, at least not for us, anyway. Slide master, slide number five, please. On September 26th, you can observe the conjunction of the moon and Saturn in the eastern evening sky. On September, oh, excuse me, uh, slide number six, please. The sixth uh, daytime meteor shower peak is on September 27th. Now, how do you observe a daytime meteor shower? Believe it or not, you use a radio. I think all of you that are participating, that would be what you have in your hands right now or listening to. You can get more information about meteors and meteor showers and how to observe them over radio from the International Meteor Organization, IMO.net, or the American Meteor Society at amsmeteors.org. Slide master, slide number seven, please. On September 28th is the time for the conjunction of the moon and the planet Neptune in the eastern evening sky. Now, you'll need to have a telescope and a good star map to find and observe Neptune. Slide master, slide number eight, please. Now, we remember we have two solar eclipses coming up very soon. A solar eclipse is when the moon is in between the Earth and the sun, and for a very few lucky people on the Earth, uh, they get some or all of the sun blocked out from their field of view. Slide master, slide number nine. The October 14th eclipse is a partial annular solar eclipse for us here in North Texas. But along a path in West Texas and into New Mexico, uh, through Arizona and Nevada and through Northern California, there's a path where the moon uh, will block out all but just a ring or annulus of sunlight from uh, view. The eclipse begins locally here. The eclipse begins at 10, uh, around 10.23 a.m., I believe. The middle of the eclipse is at around 11.52 a.m., and about 81% of the sun is covered by the moon. The eclipse ends at 1.29 p.m. Now, just to let you know, every campus of the Dallas College here in this county will have observing set up for the public, so you can find more details about that at dallascollege.edu. Slide master, slide number 10, please. On April the 8th is a total solar eclipse for us here in North Texas. Now, from the Brookhaven campus, the sun will be completely blocked out for about 3 minutes and 20 seconds between 1.41 to 1.44 p.m. Now, during that time, called totality, you'll be able to see stars in the sky just as if it were like an evening twilight. Now, the next total solar eclipse visible from North Texas won't be until the year 2317 on July the 9th. So this total solar eclipse is a very big deal since it only happens about once every 300 years here in North Texas. Almost all of the hotel rooms in downtown Dallas have already been booked by people, millions of them, that will be heading into our area. And this is KF5JJ, and this is Skynet. Slide master, slide number 11, please. Once again, the next Texas Astronomical Society of Dallas Club meeting will be held on Friday, September 22nd. That's in six days. The meeting will be held at 7.30 p.m. in person and at the, uh, at the University of Texas at Dallas and also held on Zoom. Future speaker is Lisa Actor from Lowell Observatory. She's probably going to talk about the library. And Saturday night public observing sessions are in full swing right now. So Skynet was picked to be on Saturday night so that there could be an opportunity for live reports from the Texas Astronomical Society of Dallas public observing sessions. But we didn't hear anything from anybody tonight from Cedar Hill. <clears throat> Go to texasastro.org for up-to-date information and details about meetings and public observing sessions. Now, slide master, slide number 12. Do any of you out there in radio land have a question or maybe you need a fill on any information? Uh, maybe you just have a general astronomy question. Come now with your call sign if you have a question or need a fill.
Maybe I should say, maybe let's stump the astronomer. Maybe we've gotten more response. Slide master, slide number 13. So as the moon waned last week, so do these words for this segment of Skynet. Stay safe, keep well, pray for our world. It's the only one where humans live, right now anyway. And until next time, actually I'll be doing another Skynet segment in a few minutes. Keep looking up so you know what's up. And this is KF5 JHA, back to our net control. It's all yours once again, Brenda. Okay, next up is space exploration and space history. And Tom, KE5ICX, has graciously offered to read some of this for me so that I don't have to read all night long. He's going to read the news and the history part. I'm going to read the birthdays. So go ahead, Tom. All right, very good, Brenda. And yes, Brenda put all this stuff together, so uh, she had a lot of work this week. So we have now, uh, under Space Exploration News, a new stamp. The U.S. Postal Service will be releasing a stamp commemorating the return to Earth of Osiris Rex on September 22, 2023. Next up, one of the iconic symbols of Alabama's role in the space exploration is coming down. Crews are currently working to deconstruct a 224-foot tall Saturn 1B rocket at the Alabama Welcome Center on Interstate 65 in Ardmore. The rocket has stood tall and welcomed people into Alabama for 44 years earlier this year. Leaders at the Marshall Space Flight Center announced that the rocket would come down due to its deteriorating state. Once the rocket is on the ground, NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center will take possession and handle of its safe disposal. I'm sad. Now here's one. This one's a little deceptive, but uh, I'll let you get all excited and then I'll bring down the boom. Webb Telescope finds signs of life on faraway exoplanet. NASA's James Webb Space Telescope has uncovered new evidence that the planet outside our solar system may be able to support life. The telescope discovered the presence of methane and carbon dioxide while observing K218b, an exoplanet 124 light years from Earth. K218b, initially discovered in 2015 by the Kepler Space Telescope, orbits a red dwarf star called K218. The exoplanet's relation to the red dwarf is similar to Earth's relation to the sun. K218b has a 33-day orbit within K218's habitable zone, meaning it receives the same amount of light as Earth receives from the 19 water vapor was discovered in its atmosphere. This new discovery of carbon dioxide and methane in K218b's atmosphere suggests that the exoplanet is a Hycean planet containing a hydrogen-rich atmosphere and a liquid water ocean. The term Hycean was first coined in 2021 and comes from a combination of hydrogen and ocean. It's used to describe a type of hypothetical planet that is hydrogen rich and covered in water, making them potentially habitable. There is currently no confirmed Hycean planet, but there are several good candidates, including K218b. Uh, that's it, Brenda. I'll send them related birthdays back to you. This is KE5 ICF. Oh, thank you, Tom. This is WE5 OZNL. Um, I was very dismayed to hear that story about the, the Saturn 1B. When they talk about its safe disposal, I know what they're talking about. They're going to scrap it. They're going to cut it into little pieces and sell it to the scrapyard because that's what happens. At the Frontiers of Flight Museum, we used to have, um, I think it was a Jupiter missile on the ground outside, lying, lying down, and a big storm came through, like 90 mile an hour winds, and damaged it uh, irreparably. So it was sent off to the scrapyard, and it's, it's just very sad, but what are you going to do? All right, moving on, space-related birthdays. We have Charles. Simone, September 10th, 1948, flew on Soyuz TMA-10, 
slash TMA-9, and so use TMA-14 and TMA-13. Mike Mullane, September 10th, 1945, STS-41D, STS-27, and STS-36. Randolph Bresnick, September 11th, 1967, STS-129, Soyuz MS-05, Expedition 5253. Robert Crippen, September 11th, 1937, STS-1741C and 41G. Roger K. Crouch, September 12th, 1940, STS-83 and 94. Anusha Ansari, September 12th, 1966, Soyuz TMA-9-8. Eugene H. Trent, September 14th, 1950, flew on STS-50. Springton, September 14th, 1958, flew on STS-113. Warren Hoberg, September 16th, 1985, was on SpaceX Crew-6 Expedition 6869. And lastly, Kevin R. Kriegel, September 16th, 1956, flew on STS-70, 78, 87, and 99. All right, so let's move on to This Week in Space History. I'll call on Tom, KE5ICX, to come back and give this report. All right, thank you, Brenda. And again, this is Brenda's news items and contributions for this week. JFK at Rice University. We choose to go to the moon, officially titled the address at Rice University on the nation's space effort on September 12, 1962, a speech by United States President John F. Kennedy to bolster public support for his proposal to land on the moon before 1970. Kennedy gave the speech, largely written by presidential advisor and screen speech writer Ted Thorson, to a large crowd at Rice University Stadium. Then we have, uh, let's see here, September 13, 1961, Mercury Atlas IV with an uncrewed space flight of the Mercury program. It was launched on that date at 1409 UTC at Launch Complex 14 at Cape Canaveral, Florida. A crewman a simulator instrument pack package was on board. The craft orbited the Earth once. The MA-4 mission successfully achieved all of its flight objections, objectives it had demonstrated the ability of the Atlas LV-3B rocket to lift Mercury capsule into orbit and of the capsule and its systems to operate completely autonomously as it had succeeded in obtaining pictures of Earth. Nonetheless, to be on the safe side and to test out a few more design changes, NASA still planned for one more uncrewed test before committing the Mercury-Atlas combo to crew flight. Then on September 15, 1968, Soviet Union launched Zada 5 spacecraft on a mission to loop around the moon and return to Earth. There were no cosmonauts on board Zod 5, but there were several small vertebrae, including the first two tortoises to ever go into space. Other passengers included wine flies, mealworms, plants, and seeds. These were the first animals in deep space and the first to travel around the moon. After looping around the moon, the Zod-5 spacecraft turned around and came back to Earth. It was supposed to land in Kazakhstan on September 22nd, but the spacecraft's guidance system failed, and it splashed down in the Indian Ocean instead. The Soviets did recover the capsule and found that the tortoises and other critters were still alive, although they had lost some weight since the start of the mission. Uh, that's it, Brenda. Back to you, KE-5ICX. Okay, thank you so much for reading all that for me. Uh, next, we have Miss Carolyn's Constellation of the Week, and we'll call on Chaz again. Uh, uh, K5JHA, go ahead, Chaz. Thank you, Brenda. I just thought I'd let everyone know a public service announcement. I probably will not be on Skynet next week because I'll be volunteering at the Plano Balloon Festival. Yay! No, yay for volunteering at the Plano Balloon Festival, not for not being here. Yeah, okay. 
Miss Carolyn's Constellation of the Week is named in honor of Silent Key Carolyn, KC5OZT. Carolyn contributed to Skynet each week from almost its beginning in 2012 until May of 2019 with a detailed look at one particular constellation each week. Since there are about 52 easily visible constellations seen in North Texas throughout the year out of the 80 total number of constellations, so Miss Carolyn covered the entire sky as seen over North Texas in a year. And in her honor, we have continued that tradition of a constellation per week and named this segment after her. Miss Carolyn's Constellation of the Week this week is actually a twofer. Dolphinus, the dolphin, and Equilus, the horse. Equilus, the constellation, lies in the northern sky. Its name it means little horse or foal in Latin. Equilus is the second smallest constellation in the sky. The only thing smaller is actually Crux the Cross, the southern cross. Uh, Equilus only occupies 72 square degrees. Equilus, the little horse of the foal, lies between its big brother Pegasus, you know that, the flying horse, and Delphinus, the dolphinus. Most historians agree that Ptolemy first wrote about this constellation back in the second century. Delphinus represents a dolphin sent by the sea god Poseidon to find Aphrodite, uh, whom he wanted to marry. Delphinus is the 69th uh, constellation in size, occupying only an area of 189 square degrees. The constellation also represents, uh, or sometimes referred to, the Job's coffin because of its long box-like shape. Most of the name is restricted to the four stars of the constellation, um, Alpha, Beta, Gamma, and Delta, Delphinus, that makes up the box of Job's coffin. Slide master, slide number 15, please. The joke of the week. Alright, what do you call a horse that likes to stay up late? Of course, that must be a horse that's participating in Skynet tonight, I'm sure. What do you call a horse that likes to stay up late? A nightmare! What did the mother horse say to her foal at the end of the day? It's pasture deadline? Oh, past your bedtime. Oh, I messed that up, didn't I? Oh, well, on to the next one. What kind of food do racehorses like to eat? Uh, fast food, of course. My buddy has been really depressed since his pet dolphin ran away. He said his life had no porpoise. Okay, uh, it's a joke. I know the differences between dolphins and porpoises. Why are dolphins so successful at dating? Because they always click with one another. The sounds of dolphins sounds like clicks. Yeah, okay. Dolphins give the worst directions. I always have to ask them to be more specific. Okay, maybe that wasn't such a good one. Slide master, slide number 16, please. The star Catalpha is also known as Alpha Equilus and is a spectroscopic binary star of spectral type G03. It has a visual magnitude of 3.92 and is approximately 186 light years in distance. It is the brightest star in Equilus. It is about 75 times more luminous than the sun and has uh, 2.72 times the mass of our sun. Gamma Equilus, uh, or 5 Equilus is also known, is a double star. It belongs to a special uh, spectral class, excuse me, of A9. Uh, it has a visual magnitude of 4.7 and is 118 light years in distance. Epsilon Equilus uh, is another multiple star system in Equilus. It consists of four components. It has a visual magnitude of 5.3 and is 196.4 light years distance from the sun. Our Equilus is a Myra class variable. It is a M-class red giant star. It varies in magnitude from 8.7 to 15th magnitude over a period of 260 days. It's one of the many variables that are uh, monitored by the members of the AAVSO. That's called the American, Astronaut, uh, the American Association of Variable Star Observers. Carolyn was a member of that and did uh, significant observations towards the different database that they have. Slide master, slide number 17. 
NGC 7015 is a galaxy with visual magnitude of 12.4. It is 2 minutes by 1.8 minutes in size and about 212.15 is a face-on spiral galaxy that shines at a dim magnitude, like I said, of 12.5. Okay, this is KF5JJ and this is Skynet. Slide master, slide number 18, please. Alpha Delphinus uh, is the brightest star in the constellation. It has a combined apparent magnitude of 3.77. It is a multiple star system consisting of seven different components uh, and a G oh, and a physical pair of G, B, C, D, E, and F, which are all optical binaries. Wow, that's a lot. Beta Delphini is, was discovered to be a binary star in 1873 by the American astronomer Burnham. Uh, the system is about 1.8 billion years old and consists of a pair of stars belonging to a spectral class of F53 and F54, a giant and a subgiant, approximately 101 light years in distance. Gamma Delphi is another binary star, which is about 101 light years in distance. The primary component is a yellow-white dwarf of spectral type F75, and the companion star is an orange subgiant belonging to the spectral class K14. The stars have magnitudes of 5.14 and 4.27, respectively. Struve 2725 is another separate double star that is very near Gamma Delphi. Uh, both can fit in the same eyepiece field of view. Since they're only about 14.5 arc minutes apart, about the width of the first quarter moon. Wow, pretty interesting to take a look at, maybe. Slide master, slide number 19, please. NGC 6934, also known as Caldwell 47, is a relatively large globular cluster near the star Epsilon Delphina, so approximately 50,000 light years in distance and has a visual magnitude of 8.83. Slide master, slide number 20. NGC 7006, also known as Caldwell 42, is a globular cluster located approximately 137,000 light years away in the outskirts of the Milky Way. And slide master, slide number 21 is called the Blue Flash Nebula also known as NGC 6905. It's a small planetary nebula, bluish in color. It can be observed in six inch or larger telescopes. And slide master, slide number 22. French one, also known as the toadstool. This asterism is in the Astronomical League Open Cluster Club. This group of, it's also in the asterism club. This group of stars was named the Toadstool by Sue French, the writer for the Deep Sky Wonders column in Sky and Telescope. Her earliest mention of this is in print in the Small Scope Sampler column in October of 2002 issue. This article includes a nice finder chart with a close-up view and also mentions that Unimetria, 2000 Star Atlas, even labels it as French 1. And this is KF5, JJ, and this is Skynet. Slide master, slide number 23, please. There are a lot more Astronomical League Observing Program objects in the constellation of Delphinus the Dolphin and Equalus the Horse. I've given you just a sampling of some of those objects. The Astronomical League has, at last count, 77 different observing programs. Most have around 100 objects. If you observe just 10 different objects in an observing program each month, then you can earn an observing certificate and a pen in about a year. And slide number 24, please. That is Miss Carolyn's constellation, plural, of the week. Dolphin is the dolphin and Equilus the horse. I want to thank my friends Dave Hutchinson and Dennis Harwell for their research and words on deep sky objects that I use, borrow, and steal for every Skynet. I also at times use the website constellation-guide.com for information. Now, next week, it's only going to be a single constellation. We'll take a look at 
Capricorn, the Sea Goat, and this is KF5, JJ sending it back to our net control. 73, everyone. Hope you get to see some things in the nighttime and daytime sky. Thank you very much, Chaz. This is WB5OZL. Do we have any more check-ins? Kilo Bravo 9, Sierra Oscar Kilo, Sean in Fort Worth. Richardson. There, uh, we picked up Sean K Kilo Bravo 9 Sierra Oscar Kilo, and the other one doubled with you. and I didn't get any of that except the Sharon Richardson. So, if you please uh, come back with a fill, Kilo Foxtrot 5 Papa Lima Lima Huey. Thank you, Kilo Foxtrot 5, Papa Lima Lima. Huey, thank you for joining. Okay, next we have space launches for this week. I'm going to call on Tom, K5 ICX. Go ahead, Tom. Well, thank you, Brenda. Actually, what's happened is some of these, uh, we've had a lot of missions during and launches during the summer months. It seems to have been slowing down a little bit. There's a lot of to-be-determined missions coming up, so uh, won't be as exciting or as many as usual, but I will give you what we got. We have a to-be-determined Falcon 9 launch from SLC-4E Vandenberg Space Force Base in California. Falcon 9 rocket will launch the first pair of Worldview Legion Earth Observation Satellites for Maxter Technologies. They plan to deploy six commercial Worldview Legion high-resolution remote sensing satellites into the mix of sun-synchronous and mid-inclination orbits on three SpaceX Falcon 9 rockets. First stage, the Falcon 9 will return to launch, I'm sorry, landing zone four at Vandenberg for landing. And we have in October, we go to um, the protoflight, it's called. This is uh, SOC-41 from Cape Canaveral. In Florida, the first two demonstration satellites for Amazon's Project uh, Kuiper Broadband Constellation will launch on an Atlas 501 rocket. These satellites were originally scheduled to fly on the first Vulcan rocket. We have October 4th, 5th at Vega. Theos and Plumosat at 7R Triton launch. This will be from Kourou, French Guyana. The Ariane Space will launch a Vega rocket designated VV-23, sending a collection of 12 satellites into sun-synchronous orbit. The planned main payload is Thailand Earth Observation System 2, or Theos-2, which is the Earth-observing satellite built by Air, Bus, Defense, and Space on behalf of the Kingdom of Thailand. It is designed to complement Theos-1, which launched in 2008. Secondary payload is uh, Formosat 7R Triton, which was developed for the, by the Taiwanese Space Agency, or TASA. Its Global Navigation Satellite System Refractory, GNAS-R, tool will help meteorologists gather wind data over oceans to help with forecasting trajectory and intensity of typhoons. We have an August 5th launch, Falcon Heavy, Psyche, this will launch NASA's Psyche asteroid from Launch Complex 39A. The Maxter built spacecraft will travel to the metallic asteroid Psyche where it will enter orbit in 2029. The first spacecraft to explore a metal rich asteroid, which may be a leftover core of a protoplanet that began forming in the early solar system more than 4 billion years ago. Falcon Heavy's two side boosters return to landing zones one and two at Cape Canaveral Space. Then we have uh, Falcon 9 launch, O3B, M Power 5 and 6, part of a series. SOC 40 will be the launch site at Cape Canaveral Space Force Station. 
Florida, SpaceX in Florida. A SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket will launch the third pair of O3B M Power Broadband Internet satellites into medium Earth orbit for SES of Luxembourg. The satellites built by Boeing will provide Internet services for most of the populated world, uh, building on SES's O3B network. Falcon 9's first stage booster will land on a drone ship in the Atlantic Ocean. And uh, that's it, Brenda. Uh, back to you. This is KE5ICX. Thank you very much, Tom. Okay, uh, next up, uh, recent astronomical discoveries, and this is my segment. This is from Science News, or Science Daily, um, or sciencedaily.com, and um, the title is, Discovery of Two Potential Polar Ring Galaxies suggests these stunning rare clusters might be more common than previously believed. A group of international astronomers, including researchers from Queen's University, has identified two polar ring galaxies, according to results published today in the monthly notices of the Royal Astronomical Society. Queen's researchers, Nathan Degg and Christine Speckens, Physics, Engineering, Physics, and Astronomy, led the analysis of data obtained using a telescope owned and operated by CSIRO, Australia's National Space Agency. Looking at sky maps of hydrogen gas in over 600 galaxies as part of uh, CSIRO's ASKAP radio telescope's Wallaby survey, they have identified two potential polar ring galaxies, a type of galaxy that exhibits a ring of stars and gas perpendicular to its main spiral disk. Although this is not the first time that astronomers have observed polar ring galaxies, they are the first observed using the ASKAP telescope located at... Uh, won't even... Well, I'm going to butcher it. Inyar and Manha Ilgari Bandara. CSIRO's Murchison Radio Tele uh, Astronomy Observatory on Wajari Yamaji country in Western Australia. These new detections in gas alone suggest polar ring galaxies might be more previously believed. Further investigation of polar ring structures can help us better understand how galaxies evolve. For example, one of the main hypotheses to explain the origin of polar rings is a merger where a larger galaxy swallows a smaller one. If polar ring galaxies are more common than previously thought, this could mean that these mergers are most or more frequent. In the future, polar ring galaxies can also be used to deepen our understanding of the universe with potential applications in dark matter research. It is possible to use polar rings to probe the shape of dark matter of the host galaxy which could lead to new clues about the mysterious properties of the elusive substance. Jan English, a member of the Wallaby research team and also an expert in astronomy image mark making at the University of Manitoba, developed the first images of these gaseous polar ring galaxies using a combination of optical and radio data from the different telescopes. First, optical and infrared data from the Suru telescope in Hawaii provided the image for the spiral disk of the galaxy. Then the gaseous ring was added based on data obtained from the Wallaby Survey, an international project using CSIRO's ASKAP radio telescope to detect atomic hydrogen emission from about half a million galaxies. The creation of this and other astronomical images are all composite because they include information that our eyes can't capture. In this particular case, the cold hydrogen gas component, invisible to the human eye, is seen by radi in radio light using CSIRO's ASKAP. 
The subtle colored gradient of this ring represents the orbital motions of the gas with purplish tints at the bottom, the tracing gas that moves toward the viewer while the top portion moves away. The emission from the ring was separated from the radio emission emanating from the disk of the galaxy using virtual reality tools in collaboration with Professor Tom Terrett, University of Cape Town, South Africa. Over 25 global collaborators, collaborators from Canada, Australia, South Africa, Ecuador, Burkina Faso, Germany, China, and beyond worked together to analyze the data from the first public data release of the Wallaby survey, resulting in a, the newly published paper. The next step for the team is to confirm the polar ring galaxies finding through additional observatories, I'm sorry, observations using different telescopes, including the Meerkat radio telescope in South Africa. Polar ring galaxies are some of the most spectacular looking galaxies in the universe. These findings suggest that 1 to 3 percent of nearby galaxies may have gaseous polar rings, which is much higher than suggested by optical telescopes, Dr. Nathan Degg, researcher, Department of Physics, Engineering, Physics, and Astronomy, Queen's University, Canada, Canada and lead author on the study. All right, that's it for that topic. So next up... Well, let's pause for a check-in. Anybody uh, want to check in now? Well, next we have visible satellite passages over the next couple of days. Tom, KE5, ICX. Do you have anything for us? Yes, friend, I do. I didn't quite get it into the script, but I can uh, vamp. Uh, I don't have anything good for the International Space Station, so I'll go ahead and give you the next best things. I've got uh, the Tiangong uh, Chinese Space Station. There's a couple of good passes. September 18th is a good one, minus 1.9 magnitude at 6.46 a.m., It'll reach its highest point at 68 degrees at 6.49, and it'll fall to the east-southeast at 6.52. Next, a uh, really great pass is September 20th, minus 2.2 magnitude. Uh, this is at 6.22 a.m. Reach its highest point at 6.24 at 63 degrees, and it'll fall to the southeast at 6.27. Uh, let's see what else we got. We've got um, Hubble Space Telescope. Let me look there. Uh, we've got a few good ones in there. Um, these are not quite as high inclinations, but we have September 19th, 1.6 magnitude at 6.33 a.m. Out of the west-southwest, it'll reach its highest point at 38 degrees to the south at 6.36, and it'll fall to the east-southeast at 6.40. Then we have, uh, let's see here... September 20th, 6.18 a.m. again, west-southwest. It reached its highest point in the south sky again at 6.21. It will fall to the east-southeast at 6.25. Following day, also in the morning, 6.04 a.m., it will uh, rise at 6.04, reach its highest point at 42 degrees at 6.05, and then it will fall at 6.09 to the east-southeast. And we got two more. Oh, boy, 22nd, 1.3 magnitude, 5.49 a.m. You'll notice each day it's a little bit earlier, but it's the same place and basically in the sky. Uh, it will reach uh, its highest point at 5.50 at 43 degrees to the south, 5.54 to the southeast. And then finally, I'll give you this one, 1.3 magnitude on September 23rd, 5.35 a.m. It will reach its highest point at 43 degrees. It's now coming out of shadow, so it's already at its highest point, and it will uh, fall to the east-southeast at 534. Next up is uh, Envisat, and that's our favorite north-south uh, satellite. There's a bunch in here. I'm not going to read them all because I think, well, there's just not that interesting. We do have, uh, let's see here, a uh, good one on September 18th at 3.3 uh, magnitude at 5.35 a.m. It'll reach its highest point at 45 degrees at 5.40. It 
and will follow the west-southwest at 541. On September 19th, 3.0 magnitude, this one has a good one, 4.58 a.m. out of the north-northeast, reached its highest point at uh, 74 degrees at 5.03, and uh, then it will fall into shadow at 71 degrees at 5.03. Let's see, another good one, September 21st, 2.9 magnitude, 5.22 a.m. out of the north. Uh, this will reach a uh, uh, highest point at 61 degrees at 5.57. It will fall to the west at 5.28, also going into shadow at 58 degrees. And then uh, let me give you, I'll give you two more. September 22nd, 3.5 magnitude, 4.45 a.m. Reach its highest point at 4.50. At 54 degrees, it will go into shadow at uh, that same time. And then finally, September 24th, 2.8 magnitude 510 a.m. It'll reach its highest point almost directly overhead at 515 at 82 degrees and it'll fall, uh, it'll fall at 515 also into shadow. So there you have it. All of this information is available at Heavens Above. And if you're watching the video feed, you'll see what I've been reading. Uh, this is great not only for uh, visible satellite passages, but it'll also work for amateur radio satellites as well. No special software needed. All you need to do is plug in your longitude and latitude. And if you want to, any place, anywhere, if you would like, you can register with your name and uh, with your uh, email address and a uh, password. And this information can be translated anywhere. Uh, it's free. National Space Station 3D rendering of the International Space Station, exactly as it would appear over Earth in a simulation which is also pretty cool, and there's some other stuff in there as well. Definitely worth a visit. Maybe we should do a whole uh, uh, special feature on Heavens Above. It's been greatly expanded over the last few years. Uh, back to you, Brenda. This is KE5ICX. Thank you, Tom. Well, we're about to wrap it up. We're uh, just a little bit early, so... Um, see if there's any um, astronomical Q&A. Does anybody have any questions tonight or need any fills? Okay, do we have any um, final check-ins? Well, tonight we had 23 hams participating on the air. Thanks to everyone who checked in this evening. We hope you'll join us here next week and every Saturday night at 9 p.m. to discuss astronomy, space, and space exploration. On this net, the sky is never the limit. We're always looking for net control stations for this and all other DARC nets. If you would like to try your hand at this, contact any of the net controls or send an email to nets at w5fc.org. You can follow topics and discussions about this net and astronomy in general on Facebook and Twitter, as well as our audio and video streams, video archives, and other useful internet resources by going to w5fc.org at the conclusion of this net. Until next Saturday night, this is Whiskey Bravo 5, Alaska Zulu Lima, Brenda. I'll be closing the net at 10.20 p.m. local time and returning the repeater to normal amateur use. 73, everybody, and enjoy the evening discovering the universe. And before we go, I'd like to ask KE5ICX to tell us what time we uh, start our next net. Yeah, Brenda, we'll go ahead and start at 10.30 on the button. So about nine minutes from now, KE5ICX. Thank you. See you all in a little bit.
normal state. I'm completely operational and all my circuits are functioning perfectly. Afterglow movie net. Uh, it's been about uh Ten minutes or so, and it is 10:30. So we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, this is the Afterglow Movie Net. I am KE5IC. Actually, heard me on the previous net, so now you're going to hear me on this net. I don't have a movie synopsis. Well, I do, but it's really, really long, and it's kind of entertaining, but it would take too long to do. So instead of reading that, I'm and there is no discernible wiki on this. I'm going to read you some of the reviews, which include some of the dialogue, and, or not dialogue, but some of the uh, main uh, plot points to our fine film for this evening. The film was produced in 2006 called Absolute Zero. It's a made-for-TV movie. Brenda picked it, and it's great. Not. So over on Amazon.com, people who bought this film and with verified purchases gave their feedback as to what they thought of the film. Here's one from a fellow uh, whose name is Robert. I will not give his last name. He gave it three stars and called it absolute nonsense. Absolute Zero is one of the stupidest disaster epics of the last few years in what is probably the least scientifically accurate film since Ed Wood described the particles of sunlight in Plan 9 from outer space, we are treated to a very confusing plot and involves convergence of global warming, of course, a violent shift in the polarity of Earth's magnetic field, and an ancient cave painting found in Antarctica. Who knew that a polarity shift would not only entomb Miami and ice, but simultaneously make Alaska tropical? all the while making all of the equatorial Earth dark. I clearly need to brush up on my physics. Sprinkle in a bit of corporate greed, a pointless anti-military screed, and good-looking ex-lovers who obviously are still in love. Ladle in a good helping of inane script, terrible acting, and direction. Note especially the complete lack of reaction from the mother and daughter duel who have just lost their husband and father respectively with a helping heaping of unbelievably bogus special effects. I like the windstorm the best, and you have a recipe for absolute zero. This film is utterly detestable as a conventional movie. However, if you're a diehard fan of movies so bad they're fun to mock, this is the sure winner. I give it three stars as a quality motion picture is way off the low end of the rating scale. As trash cinema, it has some wonderful moments of eye rolling, but is recommended only for experienced bad movie fans, and we are those people. Four people found this this review helpful. And then the other one I'm going to read: verified per, uh, verified. Uh, purchase from uh, Charles Dickens. Yes, that one. I didn't even know he was still alive. Uh, one star out of five eyebrows and snowflakes. On my word, this one is really bad. I love disaster movies, even lousy ones, but this one is beyond the pale. The hero, no personality, 
has a face which reveals nothing but unrelenting intensity. He is the first one in whom we note the eyebrows, heavily penciled in. Why? Don't know. Everyone else has thick eyebrows, too. But the other most egregious ones are those of his love interest, a platinum blonde whose dark roots show and whose eyebrows are deeply penciled in. One eyes keep flashing from her roots to her eyebrows and back, but enough for the makeup department. The movie would almost be laughable, except there are so many mistakes and inconsistencies and cheapo decisions that I couldn't wait for it to be over and was concentrating on which library fair I would donate it to. I do not, and I do not get rid of movies. I save everything. Not this one. A few examples of how cheapo and bird brain this movie is. One, the drifting snowflakes are totally visible as snowflakes. I love disaster movies with a lot of snow, so this was one of my main snarls for this movie. Two, you're in Miami with sunbathers on a beach, and suddenly there's a very fake-looking iceberg sitting in the water. Sunbathers continue to bathe and stare oddly at the iceberg, which looks like a block of cardboard photoshopped in. Three, the primary scientific discoveries are made by two lame students from the University of Miami. Four, the hero is seen one moment stranded all alone on the Antarctic tundra, and the next moment he's strolling a corridor in a Miami building. Did the rescue end up on the cutting room floor, or was there just never any rescue shot because somebody said, too much money for a helicopter? There is a helicopter which hovers over a frozen building for what seems like, oh, 20 or 30 minutes before it smashes into the roof. When the blizzard hits Miami, we cut back and forth between frozen oceans and houses covered on the roofs with snow and then back to the same Floridian sunbathers trotting for cover, still in bathing suits and not a one shivering. Six, in one close-up of blood, you could pick up a paintbrush and swish the fire engine watercolor paint right on a piece of paper. Seven, that Miami weather changes moment to moment from a tornado wind to a gently wafting breeze to sunlight to blizzard. Eight, a man is killed when a palm tree smashes through his windshield and his car is then swallowed up by what appears to be a black hole. After this guy dies, about 20 minutes later, his daughter rather pensively says, I miss dad, and her mother says, me too. Their level of emotion is approximately what we see after Amster. So there's a small sampling of absolute cheer. zero. I would, I would recommend it to hamsters. No one else. And thank you, Charles Dickens. That was great. That's the only two I'm going to read, and it gives you kind of an idea of the plot. Even if you haven't seen this turkey, you know what the gobble gobble is, so feel free to uh, kick in your comments no matter what. Once the check-ins have uh, revealed themselves, we'll go through the plot, followed by characterization, followed by special effects, hamsters not included. So if you uh, saw this fine film or didn't, that's fine. Uh, please come with your call sign, your name, did you see? Absolute zero. Here we go. November Tango 5, Tango Mike. Tony and Dallas. I picked the wrong week to start sniffing glue. I mean, watching movies again. Kilo Bravo 9, Sir Oscar Kilo. Shot in Fort Worth. Yes, I've seen this one. Whiskey Bravo 5, Oscar uh, Zulu Lima, this is Brenda. Uh, yes, I saw this wonderful movie. I picked it, right? And uh, so uh, we're going to have a wonderful discussion, aren't we?
kilo India, five kilo whiskey golf cruise at Arlington. Oh yeah, I saw it. Okay, they're all reluctantly checking in. Let me go ahead and get the four so far. NT5TM, Tony in Dallas. Yes, he's sniffing glue and watch this film, probably both at the same time, because it's about the only way to do it and survive. KB5, KB9, that's okay. That would be Sean in Fort Worth. Yes, he saw it. WB5OZL, Brenda in Dallas. Yes, she saw it. KI5KWG, Cruz in Arlington. Lucky devil, he saw it as well. I'll go ahead and ask uh, Echo Link. There's at least uh, a couple of people there. If oh, they're they're starting to disappear. They're jumping ship quickly. Anyone in Echo Link would like to join us? Please come now. I'll give you extra time. Okay, as I suspected, anyone else would like to join us, please come with your call sign. Your name, did you see? Absolute zero with hamsters. Okay, I don't hear anyone. Uh, maybe a small group tonight, uh, maybe because we're starting just uh, a little bit earlier than normal. We'll see what all happens. Uh, let's go ahead and get started. Tony, NT5TM. Tony, you're at the top of the list. Tell us about tonight's movie, Absolute Zero. What did you think about the plot? I know you've got a lot of positive things to talk about. Please go ahead. Well, yeah. I mean, I, I honestly had a pretty good day today. We had a public service uh, event uh, here at White Rock Lake. It was really great to be out there in the morning and see everybody uh, running and hiking and marching around the lake. Uh, I just love being around smiling, energetic people, the exact sort of people who did not appear in this movie. I found the plot to be incomprehensible, and I watched this movie after I took my nap. That was probably a mistake. It would have been more fun if I had slept less or drunk more. There were basically three acts. Something happened in Antarctica, together with bad matte paintings and incomprehensibly awful CGI that looked like in-game footage from Half-Life 2. And then they went to Florida, where we had bad eye candy not any good at all and then for some reason people were wearing cheap knockoff pumpkin suits like they're going to be launched on the space shuttle and i didn't understand why that was going to happen at all and so i vote incomprehensible in the plot and i'll have more bad things to say about the movie later nt5 tm All right, thank you, Tony. And now I find a regular uh, uh, thing from 20th Century Fox Wiki. Apparently, they they actually have one and, and review all their own movies. And who knew? I didn't know that. But at any rate, it's here. Uh, it, although it does say fandom.com. Okay, uh, I digress. kb 9 sok Sean, you've got some wonderful positive comments for our fine film this evening. Please go ahead with them from ke 5 i 6 Yeah, this is KB9, that's okay. Oh, man, we, we've got to stop watching these uh, movies that have anything to do with storms. <laughs> this, uh, unfortunately, was giving me vibes of Jetstream all over again, uh, which is still, in my opinion, the worst movie we've ever seen, and this one was right up there with it. <laughs> uh, yeah, as everybody said, the, the, the yeah, absolutely, completely crazy plot uh, that made no sense, you know, even from the very beginning. You know, with the whole, you know, horrible scene that was supposed to be in Antarctica. You know, they're finding these these drawings, which really didn't have a whole lot to really do with the story. <laughs> but it's like just thrown in, I guess, so they could just show the ground shaking and uh, the weather changing, I guess. is really why that was there. Uh, to, yeah, to get back to the 
instantaneously <laughs> as mentioned back to the city uh you know even though he was trapped out there nobody knew he was trapped out there but yet he was instantly saved um uh, I, I don't even hardly know the list of what's going on and off. We were to, I mean, we could literally go minute by minute and find an issue with this movie, uh, you know, with the science and what have you, uh, just with the craziness of what they should happen. And, yeah, uh, I think your uh, comments, your reviews you read pretty well nailed most of the, the issues. That we might be better off just going through reading comments from different reviews. might be about as good. Uh yeah, no, there was a lot of issues with this one. Yeah, everything from the, the horrible acting to the uh, the lack of emotion to the horrible science and, you know, the, the whole thing with the, you know, instantly freezing. You could be, if you're a foot away from it, you're perfectly safe, you know, as it was slowly freezing the area. But yet, for some reason, they were magically safe in this vault, I guess, that was made out of flimsy metal and concrete. But yet, it froze everything else completely. Uh you know, now I could maybe see if they'd put some kind of vault 50 stories down underground or something that they could have survived it, maybe. But, uh, yeah, th this thing was just, yeah. Uh, there's the, probably the worst part, probably the most interesting part, probably when we get into characterization, because that's really where this movie is even worse than the plot. <laughs> so, anyway, yeah, I'm not going to dwell on it. Back to that, KB9, that's okay. Okay, very good. Thank you, Sean. Next is Brenda, WB5OZL. Now, I know you like this film, and you gleefully watched it with us uh, last night, uh, remotely but together. Uh, what did you think of the plot from KE5I? This is WB5OZL. Well, um, I'm recalling what my mother used to say. Um, if you keep making that face, it's going to freeze that way. So. I hope that doesn't happen, that looking aghast at the TV, that my face might stay that way forever. Because that's the reaction I had for this movie. This was absolutely abhorrent. Uh, I, I have nothing, nothing good to say about the plot, for sure. Uh, it was stupid. It was unscientific. I mean, they're just stretching. They're, yes, there are polar shifts, and they happen over a long period of time. We've had many in the past. But they're trying to say that there was one with, they found pictographs in a cave, which I think the, the oldest cave paintings are maybe 27,000 years old. And um, these um, magnetic field shifts happen like every 300 years, uh, sorry, 300,000, 400,000 years. And by the way, we're overdue. It's been like seven or eight hundred thousand years since we've had one. So yeah, they do happen, but they don't happen in a matter of minutes. And if they did, I, you know, I, I don't see that you have that kind of cataclysmic uh, weather event. Uh, I think we would have some kind of archaeological evidence of a weather event like what they experienced. Anyway, that was stupid, but, you know, you wouldn't have much of a movie if the thing took a long time to flip, so I guess they had to make it exciting. I didn't understand what the little orange suits did for them. I didn't understand how seeking refuge in that room would have helped. Why did they have electricity and heat? And uh, what did they have to eat and drink? And... Um, you know, how did they survive? What do they expect to do next? How are they going to get out? And um, they, uh, you know, helicopter is, um, you know, a nice way out, but they don't have long range. I don't know where the helicopter was going to take them to or if it had much fuel left. And why would a helicopter pilot be wanting to fly around in this stuff anyway? So, let's see, what else can I say about it? Um, the, yeah, we're going to get on the characters later. They, they were just awful. Uh, there's a good reason. We never heard of this movie before. Okay, back to that, WB5OZL.
All right, thank you, Brenda. And I have ice cream to keep me awake tonight. And um, believe it or not, I still think Jetstream was a worse movie, if that's even possible. And, and that's a pretty bad movie. Okay, next up is Cruise, KI5KWG. Cruise, pull out the notebook, the spiral, give us your analysis and uh, 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 comments on the plot, please, from KE5ICX. And I'll eat my ice cream. KI5KWG. I took no notes uh, while watching this film. I did jot down my attempt to... Uh, um, at the plot, to describe the plot um, during Skynet. This is what I wrote. Four people have to get into some room on a very particular building floor for no particular reason. The news anchor was just fine without having to run the ridiculous obstacle course to get to that room. I believe there were four examples of using radio, so that was good but there were no examples of sharks, which was an obvious lacking. That's what I have. And that is enough, isn't it? KI-5. Oh, wait, wait, Tom. I need to hear, where was the Charles Dickens review of this movie? I want to go back and read that. So please uh, share that with us. I missed the, the location of that. All right, back to net, KI-5, KWG. Ah, thank you. Uh, there are crews. It's actually Amazon.com. So just look for the. Is this a thing? Grace us with a Blu-ray release. Uh, it, it read as absolute zero, an inconvenient reality. That's all you have to do is look for it, and you'll find it. And it's uh, C. Dickens. C. Dickens. There's a bunch of other really good reviews in here too. So there you have it. All right, uh, let me go ahead and ask if there's any additional check-ins before we uh, continue on. If you'd like to join us, please come now with your call sign, phonetically your name, and did you see tonight's fine film, Absolute Zero, from 2005? This could be a quick uh, nap this evening. Okay, um, I'll make my comments. Yes, well, anytime I fall asleep during a movie, and, and I did several times on this one, uh, there's no doubt that this one lacks something that it needs very badly, and that is, in this case, a plot. I don't know why they can't find people to do this stuff, but, you know, you know, some sort of scientific uh, advisor and then actually listen to them, but that's not going to happen. And it wouldn't be nearly as interesting. So this is just a knockoff of Day After Tomorrow, which came out the year before. So no surprise there. Special effects are pretty terrible. Made for TV movie. This is like the second one in a row we've had a made for TV movie. I didn't even know they made made for TV movies anymore. Because why? Why bother? I don't know who the studio or who the uh, network was that went ahead and put the money for this, but they should have got their money back because it was pretty terrible. Um, <clears throat> let's see, it started out fine with all those scenes of the uh, a Antarctic. It looked really cool because it was really the Antarctic. It must have been stock footage or something they found somewhere. It looked good. The snow cats or whatever they were, they had the one that drove slowly back and forth, back and forth. And then they had the one guy who, like, fell 300 feet into the crevice and then managed to survive just long enough to tell the guy who got, went down there after him that he lived and showed him the uh, the little, I don't know what it is, the, the uh, carving. Should a poor poor guy look like the writer tearing his hair out. It's one of those graphic things that you see. Horrible. So, as, as you know, as usual, the characters, the, the, the star of the show is the bad special effects. The acting is terrible. I don't know who these people are. One guy named... Uh, what was it, Bill Cole or something? I don't know. The guy who was in it, he went on and changed his name and became a professor at a Canadian uh, community college somewhere and does the drama. So there you have it. 
when you can't work anymore, you those who can't teach, or those who are blacklisted probably go and teach. I don't know. Uh, why is it? Um, how do they pitch these things? Is probably the biggest question I have. How do they do this? And who makes the decision? It sounds like when they pitch the story, the elevator pitch to whoever the person is putting the bill, wow, you can do this, it'll be just like day after tomorrow, only it'll be in one-tenth the budget. It'll look great because we have these wonderful special effects, and i got these four friends of mine that uh, have acted in high school productions, and they're going to be our leads in this, so we'll get them cheap. It'll be a fantastic show. We're going to film it in color, and there'll be microphones and film projectors and cameras and everything. It'll be great. Okay, Al, how much How much do you need? Uh, about $700? Is, is that okay? $500? And, then, and it's yours. So, gosh. That kind of reminds me of that, what was the film Beyond Light and Time or something with the guy who made the weird film? At any rate, um, I, I don't have much to add to this except that it was really terrible. Miami looked nice. I mean, except when they had to say, oh, the fake storms. This is more special effects, but if you watch carefully, you can see, you know, uh, people throwing lawn furniture around on, uh, off from the sides of the cameras. Uh, and then in the background, you'll see, like, palm trees and orchids and things like that. And they're just in a gentle breeze. But the furniture itself is being, you know, thrown around and it's hitting the actors in the head, man, and it looks like they're screaming and yelling and they're bleeding and it, you know, but how are you going to sell that when it looks so idyllic behind it? The fake snowflakes? True. Uh, very fake, fake, fake flakes. That's exactly what they were. Didn't make any sense. And the floaties, don't forget, the, the lawn furniture, not just the lawn furniture, but the floaties in the pool uh, didn't move either. They just kind of floated uh, serenely in the water while all the heavy objects were flying around. Don't forget, too, the vehicle got flipped over a few dozen times by the hand-drawn storm. That looks really great, too. Okay, all I can tell you is pretty terrible. Oh, well. All right, well, let's see. I've made that clear. Let's go to the actors. We'll talk about the actors. We can get out of this thing early. So, uh, Tony, tell us what you think about the acting characterization for tonight's movie, Absolute Zero, from 2005. You're just here to get the job done. You, Why are you trying to have a relationship with the other characters? Shouted one of the characters. Uh, the characters were all awful and stereotypes and you know it used to be the only redeeming feature of b-movies was like uh, like this was that they were attractive but no they weren't they they couldn't even have you know hire good extras to to pose in the pools and throw floaties at each other uh that was in my notes actually was that you could see people throwing the floaties and uh, they just look like random people who were at the hotel that day. Like, ah, <laughs> here, we'll give you $5 to throw a pool float at one of the other people who was at the hotel that day. So, <sighs> yeah, just didn't care. Nothing interesting. NT5 Tia. Man, this is going really fast. Okay, I know Sean's got some substantive things to say. At least Tony saw the movie, everybody. Hey, he, he's refused to watch the movies for the last month, and then he saw this one. Okay, KB9S, okay, Sean, your, your comments on uh, characterization and acting. Yeah, this is KB9S, okay. And yes, Tony, you picked the wrong week to come back. <laughs> At least we had some watchable ones for previous weeks. <laughs> oh, yeah, these characters were, uh, you know, our lead. I'm wondering, I, I didn't look it up, but I'm almost thinking this movie was made for the Sci-Fi Channel. Because um, the lead actor and the, uh, the love interest slash wife of the other character, I'm pretty sure I've seen those two in other movies on Sci-Fi Channel uh, back in that time frame. And all of them were about this level of quality, which is about the time I decided to stop watching Sci-Fi Channel, uh, <laughs> because they were pretty bad. 
Uh, so yeah, our our main lead guy was yeah, well, not very good lead. Uh, as mentioned, all these characters didn't have a whole lot of expression. Uh, you know, the was you know when he did try to show emotion, it was kind of over the top. Almost felt like I was going to a high school play. Uh, somebody's never acted before. Uh, kind of situation. Um, his his BFF that you know that ended up getting impelled by a palm tree that was clearly just thrown into the car <laughs> uh, was uh, pretty bad as well. And that, he was completely motionless most of the time. Um, and then, yeah, the love interest, yeah, it's uh, her and her daughter. Yeah, everybody's already mentioned it about them not exactly being broken up, that, uh, that their dad and wife, husband just died, and they don't seem to really care too much. Um, and then we had the two assistants, you know, of course, they, they tried to make them the comical relief, but they particularly weren't. Um, you know, you had the, the, the girl that was supposed to be very capable, straight-A student. Then you had the, the slacker that uh, he liked the girl, but he apparently didn't know nothing about, about science. And apparently he'd made the third, his third year of school and still didn't know nothing about science. <laughs> uh, you know, they, 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 part of the plot thing, and, and, you know, being a person that's been in IT for quite a few years, Anytime they show somebody trying to hack into something, you know, they show the girl, you know, just because apparently she's I, some kind of scientist, but she's magically a hacker, too. You know, she's sitting there and they're showing the screen, which is showing absolutely nothing. And she's typing away, but nothing's typing on the screen. Uh, you know, she gets to the password and goes, oh, a password. And then half a second later, she magically knows the password. Um, I, it's just, <laughs> I really, as I already mentioned, they really need to bring at least, you know, a consultant in for just the, well, they need to do the whole movie in general, but, you know, how hard it is just to get some basic consulting on the science, and then, you know, even on those simple scenes like that, at least make it look somewhat realistic. Um, but, yeah, completely unbelievable. Um, and let's see, who else was in this turkey? Uh, yeah, those are the main characters. Then, yeah, I already mentioned the extras. Yeah, they were, they were strictly hired just to throw stuff around, apparently. Yeah, the eye candy wasn't in this movie. Uh, for sure, and yeah, that uh, yeah, special effects will be special when we get to that round. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to think of something else. Is, was there anything positive with any of the actors other than well, you know, it might have been better if they'd all died. <laughs> At least that'd be put to rest. Uh, but yeah, you know, well, at the beginning when the one guy did fly down, fall down the cavity, no one really seemed to care. And he was apparently the, the most liked person in that uh, particular group. So yeah, no weird. Anyway, yeah, this this movie is so bad, it's almost hard to find things to say. And, you know, when we're usually pretty good at finding things to beat it up on, but just everything was bad. So, anyway, back to that, KB9, that's okay. All right, thank you, Sean. And uh, now we're going to move to Brenda, and I found it actually forced that uh, your uh, thoughts on characterization and acting on our great film night called Absolute Zero, which is probably what it, it, it should be rated as, <clears throat> from 2005, from KE5 ICS. This is kb 5 ozl Well, what this movie really needed was a giant mantis, and uh, some sharks, and a giant eyeball and uh, Mars cats, or moon cats, um, voluptuous women, I don't know, th things that those other movies have that this was really lacking. So the characters were all caricatures, mostly. The bad guy was unbelievably bad. Nobody would really be like that, but he was. And, uh, you know, our hero is so noble. He's going to go save the bad guy, even though he didn't deserve to be safe, but his own life in danger. Um, yeah, you know, the, the poor guy who died in the car sacrificed himself for his family, and uh, nobody even cared. Doubt if they even remembered his name when it was over. Um... And, you know, why did they have to crawl on that 
rail outside. I mean, what was that rail even there? Something that you could climb on outside. Buildings don't have that. I said that was just illogical. And, um, but, um, the characters, I'm, I'm sure the actors, I guess they were glad to get a paycheck, but I'm sure they were very embarrassed to be seen in this movie because it was a stinker. So what else can I say about characters? Um, these scientists were not very believable as scientists. I'll have to say that. Uh, oh, and the, the girl wizard, the one who just sits down and just knows what the password is. I've never known anybody that could do that. I know hackers get in, but they don't do it in, you know, 30 seconds. It, t- it takes a while for them to, to run their programs. But she could, because she's so brilliant. And then um, the hapless guy that took a sign to her, you know, was just really inept and dumb. So, you know, the char- the characters were, you know, it they were like the right demographics, the right age, and you know the the right type. It was just so much more over the top than it should have been. All right, back to Nat WB Five OZL. Okay, Brenda. Well, you tried. Next is Cruise K I Five K W G. Cruise. Your thoughts on characters and characters? Uh, acting and characterization. KI5 KWG. I was a little distracted. Uh, I was looking up uh, on YouTube hamster death stories. There's a whole category of them, by the way. <laughs> um, by the way, I wanted Johnny Five stories tonight. Uh, anyway, um, on acting, I think I made this comment last night. At I didn't write it in my notebook, but the uh, news anchor lady, I believe, might have been nominated for an Emmy for this uh, made-for-TV film um, because she did her lines with a straight face. And uh, we don't know how many takes, but she did deliver her lines with a straight face. Um, Yeah, I think that's it. KI5, KWG, back to that. Okay, we're in real serious trouble tonight. Okay, um, anyone else want to join us? Uh, please come with your call, your name, and did you see Absolute Zero from 2005? I'm beginning to believe that this one will probably go down as one of our shorter nets. Even though usually even terrible movies get, excuse me, the full 90-minute treatment, I don't think this is going to be one of them. Okay, characterization. What can I say? Let me see. Yeah, David Koch or Gotchman or whatever his name is, the clientologist, he was boring. Um or shifts, uh, uh, and he appear, suddenly appears in Miami. Um, I guess, oh, uh, I don't know. He was okay, I guess, in the end, but he was rather annoying as human beings go. Um, but he did try and go and find his buddy that was down in the bottom of the ravine, found him, and then ended up in Miami and saved other people there. So that was okay. <clears throat> Let's see. We have... Um, was it the boss, the, the greedy boss, he wants to, uh, everybody has a greedy boss, you know, and I, oh, you know what, I want to know where the safe room is, every company should have a safe room somewhere, so apparently this one does, because that's what they do, is uh, worry about freezing places and all that, so, I don't know, um, oh, uh, 
is there anything to say about these people? Uh, the kid was annoying, kept running off, you know, like Lassie does. If I remember, I think she did a couple of times. She did something. I did have one thing that the actors made me do is clear motivation is I wanted to see them all die swift. I thought about slow lingering deaths, but I, that was me. I was having a slow lingering death watching this thing. And uh, even trying to go unconscious and sleep, I would wake up from some noise and some whiny person on the screen speaking, trying to save somebody else or something, so I don't know. Uh, in any case, it was really hard to watch. All I wanted them to do was to die. And there'd be no sequel or any hope for a sequel. The United States and the world just goes up and breathes a little giant popsicle. Oh, well. What can I say? Jeez, I wish I could say something that was interesting about these people, but they weren't interesting, so I don't have a lot. Okay, well, this one's maybe a very quick one. I'll go up to, uh, we'll go up to Special Effects. This should be good. We'll start with Tony, NT5TM. Tony, uh, you were, uh, take, take a swing at special or not so special effects for our fine film from KE5ITX. <laughs> oh, they were awful. Uh, the worst, the worst pair of two something was in a car saying, "Run, leave me, go hide in the sewer pipe." And you know, bleeding from the head is bad, and bleeding from the head is especially bad if it turns out that you're bleeding temperpane. Because how did that even get in your system? It's not made of blood. It's like you're a space alien, and you're bleeding paint out of your ears. Ew. I mean, we do better fake blood at third exercises. That was just horrendous. Uh, aside from that, most things were worse. I, I particularly wanted to single out the, the, the American flag that was repeatedly shown flapping over their Antarctic outpost that was the only thing in that shot that wasn't desaturated and it was a very obvious cheap desaturation effect. Uh, the matte paintings, which probably weren't paintings, they were probably just, you know, some digital background. Uh, they were bad. Uh, bad, 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 bad. NT5 TM. Okay, well, that's, that's bad, 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 bad. Okay, it's a bad, 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 bad movie. Okay, well, yeah, we're gonna get through this really quick. Okay, uh, Sean, KB9, that's okay. Your thoughts on special effects or anything else you wanna add? Yeah, this is KB9, that's okay. Well, the music was horrible. <laughs> it wasn't even any good. Um, yeah, as everybody's mentioned, the horrible CG background in pretty much every scene, except for a couple that were actually real scenes, uh, was absolutely horrendous. Uh, I've seen better work on, you know, basic YouTube videos with the green screen uh, than in this movie. Then, <laughs> um, yeah, everybody mentioned already, just people throwing stuff around. You know, the tree going through the windshield of the car looked completely unreal. Um, you know, the... Yeah, one of the worst effects, yeah, was when the car was lifted up off the ground and that, you know, what was supposed to be some kind of tornado thing, which looks so, so horrible. I, I'm, I'm pretty sure uh, whatever software they used, they should be very ashamed of themselves. Um, I would not use this advertisement for the software because it was absolutely horrendous. Um, the storms that they showed looked absolutely horrible. Uh, <laughs> there's just not a lot good to say here. Uh, Oh, let's see what other scenes are there. <laughs> well, they're just all pretty bad, actually. Uh, yeah, no, it's just bad all the way around. As somebody already said, the name pretty describes it. This is a zero, uh, and it was in its name. Uh, but yeah, the, I, I do agree that I still think actually Jetstream was worse. Not by a lot, but it was still worse. But yeah, this was right up there. Uh, at times, it was almost laughable. Uh, <laughs> other than that, I don't have a lot to say about this one other than anybody listening, don't watch this. 
<laughs> Stay away from it. Uh, anyway, uh, interesting as always. Yeah, I think this is the shortest net I've been on since we started this. So, you know, uh, of course, to put things in contrast, it's, you know, well, it was just three or four weeks ago we watched probably one of the best movies of all time, 2001, and now we watch this turkey. <laughs> we definitely cover the gambit. <laughs> all right, back to that. KB9 is okay. Okay, thank you, Sean. Yeah, well, that's the point of it, right? And, and you know, I've said this many times before, but it's fascinating. It's like watching a train wreck. How can somebody make, like, 2001, which actually was sort of a train wreck when you think about it, uh, it just turned out to be a good movie, and the fact that, that uh, uh, what was it, that, uh, 20th century had the money uh, to go ahead and keep pushing the film, Shepard Studios, I think, was involved, so they kept uh, shoveling money that way. Well, if you work hard enough and long enough and you do it with the right people, you can make a good film or a great film, but it costs you tons and tons of money in order to do so. So uh, that's not never the case with science fiction films. Uh, many times they're not understood, and the budget runs out because nobody knew how much it would really cost to make a particular film, or you make a cheapy like this, and you just skimp on everything and put a knockoff off, uh, hoping that uh, nobody realizes that this isn't day after tomorrow, this is something else far less, but you know, uh, it is what it is. Okay, next up is Brenda, Brenda, WV5OZL, Brenda, your comments on special effects. This is WB5 OZL. You mean not so special effects. Uh, I guess there was some stock footage of storms and things. I'm a little curious about that, how they had this, I don't know what it was, this uh, massive storm that came through, uh, which is, was, that was just unbelievable to start with, that a storm could, could work up that fast. And, uh, uh, you know, it'd be so dangerous and so deadly in such a big hurry. Um, special effects. Oh, my. Um, well, the stuff in Antarctica was kind of kind of cool. They had, um, um, the earthquakes and all that. I did enjoy the cookout there in Antarctica. That was pretty quaint. Um, I do know if you camp out in places like that where it's so cold, if you fry an egg and put it on your plate, it's going to be frozen before you eat it. The best thing is just to eat it while it's still on the fire, just directly out of the cooking pan. But they were acting like it was a, kind of a nice, balmy spring day to do a cookout. So everything was so wrong about this movie, uh, and not just the special effects. Uh, it was just dumb and just stupid. That's all you can say. It, I mean, it, I don't know why they even showed up and made this thing up. I'd love to know what the budget was and what the uh, box office was, because uh, I'll, bet, I'll bet we would be surprised. All right, back to that, wb 5 ozl Okie dokie. Thank you, Brenda. And finally, Cruz, KI5KWG, your thoughts on special effects for our fine film. Yeah, Sean's right about the uh, 2001 is why this one just hit so flat. Uh, I'll tell you, it's interesting because when he said that, I was nodding my head. Um, last night, out of boredom, I said, I want to read the Clark's novel. I, I read that like in high school, maybe college. I'm not sure. It was a long time ago. And uh, so I bought the, uh, the Kindle edition, and I started reading uh, 2001 today. And um, I'm enjoying it. But um, uh, this film, they didn't try in every scene. Um, Maybe that was that makeup person's fault, but that's what he looked like. And um, 
oh, we're talking about special effects, pardon me. Um, the giant lime green body held radio. <laughs> what was that? It was like four times the size of that World War II walkie talkie they carried around. I don't know what it was. But I was like, why? Just throw a bay of fang in there. Just use one of those. They're everywhere in their cheap. But they seem to have made this thing out of paper mache or something. Oh, that iceberg um, floating into Miami. That was so realistic. <laughs> like the Monty Python artwork <laughs> being shoved across another photo. Oh, that was bad. That was bad. I would rather do a review of hamster death stories on YouTube than this. Um, do I have anything else? Uh, lime green body held BT radio iceberg. Uh, no, I I think I'm there. I I think that's every. I've squeezed every drop out of this movie that there was to squeeze. K high five, KWG back to bed. Oh man, I I'd forgotten about the radio. That was great. He's sitting in the driver on the uh, passenger side, pulls out the radio. It's this giant radio with a giant floppy uh, antenna on it. It's like, uh, oh my god, that was hilarious. Like the, I think this is probably. I remember we, I found a, I'm trying to remember exactly how it all worked out. There was a, a um, some sort of a blow up Motorola radio or something we gave away at, at, at a meeting one time. And uh, one, of, one of the guys, one, one of the guys won the thing and he's standing there holding the thing with the giant floppy head done on it and everything else. And that's exactly what it reminded me of. And I swear that's what it was. It, I bet it was. I bet you the stupid radio was some sort of a demo thing for Motorola or some company somewhere, and and they, that's what they used. It just looked so stupid, but then why not? Stupid actors in a stupid movie portraying a stupid plot with stupid resolution and stupid props. All in all, it's pretty much consistently stupid. So there you have it. I don't know. Uh, what else to add? I thought the helicopter hovering for like half an hour and the movie running out of fuel uh, and exploding. And it, oh, geez. Oh, what a mess. What a mess. They had two people who wrote the thing, so I, I don't know. I didn't, maybe they were passing the vodka bottle back and forth excessively. I could see the cast drinking completely through this film. and makes perfect sense to me. I can't even pick on any of these people because they're not even really decent, uh, had any decent acting gigs. Oh, that one guy did have a, a number of, a couple of dozen movies under his credit, but, uh, and went on to be a Canadian, uh, Canadian uh, uh, instructor, professor somewhere. Okay, uh, I'll go ahead and ask if anybody's got any final comments about this, and then I'll reveal next week's movie, which will be a little different than what you may see in the list. And if you got something uh, you would like to add, anything else, colorful metaphors, uh, 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 whatever you got, uh, please come to your call now. Okay, well, we're going to end about a half hour early, actually more than that, but uh, that's okay. So uh, we're going to mix it up a little bit. David Martin left. Uh, he's a ham. I can. I think he's contributed to our nets in the past a while back. I'm not sure. Maybe thinking of the wrong David. At any rate, he recommended over on Facebook a movie called Warning from 2021. It's available on Tubi TV. And uh, uh, Cruz, you looked at it and you thought, ah, it might be okay. Uh, this one is another one of those uh, environmental disaster films. Mankind faces deadly consequences when a global storm causes the omniscient uh, technology they created to malfunction in this sci-fi throw. It's a series of vignettes uh, inside of a bigger story with a theme. So um, 
might be interesting. We'll, we'll see how it all goes. Uh, I got five out of ten stars, so it's got to be better than one out of four stars for this thing that we just watched. So that'll be next week's movie. I'll send out the updated uh, li- and, and modify the updated list so that you have the right film in hand for next week, and maybe we'll have a little longer discussion. I suspect we will, simply because there's different vignettes we can discuss. This plot was just so freaking thin, with so little to, to uh, even to make fun of it, there's only a few scenes that really in the whole film they just repeat over and over again. So maybe this next one will be a little better. All right, with that, we're going to close this baby down a half an hour early. Go watch uh, Hans Conrad in uh, uh, Kojak Night Stalker. At least you'll have something to, to watch there. And then Lost in Space after that if you're awake. That's it for me. Uh, I'm going to say 7-3 to everybody. Have a good evening. And you may continue to talk amongst yourselves if you'd like. But uh, we're going to close this net down. See y'all. KE5ICX. Now clear. KI5KWG. I miss Fluffy. <laughs>